I think we all have a favorite confessor that we like to go to. But can you imagine hiking several miles on foot just to go to confession to your favorite confessor? In this story of St. John Bosco, there are 300 young men who hike a great distance just to go to confession to him. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Young people feel generous toward those who sincerely love them and seek their proper good. For example, crowds of children and young people flock to the person of Jesus Christ, the divine savior, for he loved them far more than a tender father loves his children. And St. Philip Neri, the apostle of Rome, went everywhere surrounded by young people, for he treated them with unequaled goodness. The same was true of St. John Bosco who was greatly loved by his youngsters, and the facts I'm about to narrate are indisputable proof of this. In addition to the work of the oratory, Don Bosco also performed sacred ministry in the prisons, in the Contalengo hospice, and at the refuge, so very little free time was left to him. His days were so busy that he had to study and work at night to write his books. This long and arduous work nearly cost him his life, and his health deteriorated so severely that his doctors advised him to stop working and rest if he didn't want to die in the prime of his life. Don Borel, who loved him as a brother, saw him in danger. He sent Don Bosco to spend some time in the house of the excellent theologian Pietro Abondiolio, pastor of Sassi, a suburb of Turin. Don Bosco rested there on weekdays. On Saturday evenings, he returned to the city to spend each Sunday with his young students. Despite the good pastor's charitable attention and the healthy air, this time of rest did not benefit Don Bosco the way he needed. One reason was that he was working as the assistant parish priest because he didn't remain idle for a single moment. Another reason was that the suburb was so close to Turin. Hence, the boys of the oratory often visited him in Sassi. Together with the town's young people, they did much work for him. And not only the boys of the oratory ran to Sassi, so did the students of the Brothers of the Christian Schools, who once placed him in an embarrassing situation. This account comes from Signor Carlo Rapetti, who was then bursar in the College of St. Primitive and from others present. Among the schools wisely directed by the previously mentioned religious were the municipal schools of Turin, called Santa Barbara, attended by several hundred youngsters. Don Bosco went there every week to hear confessions in the adjoining chapel. Some came to him at the oratory, and almost all were his penitents. In the late spring of that year, they were given spiritual exercises for a number of days. They waited for Don Bosco during their sacred retreat, hoping he would come as usual. Almost none of them considered confessing to the other priests that were available. Finally, the closing day of the retreat came around, and not having seen Don Bosco the entire time, the retreat participants went to look for him in Valdoco with the permission of their teachers. Not finding him there either, and hearing that he was in Sassi, they set out to walk there, believing the suburb was only a short distance from Turin. They didn't realize that they had several kilometers to travel both ways. They should have ceased their trek and returned to their college when they realized that they had to leave the city and cross the Po River. But wise thinking was never the virtue of youth, and those boys listened only to the voice of their hearts. So they continued on. The weather was rainy and they reached an unfamiliar location. They lost their way and searched for Don Bosco through the meadows, fields, and vineyards. The people who met them asked, where are you going? Who are you looking for? We're going to Sassi and looking for Don Bosco, they answered. Where is Sassi? Where is Don Bosco? Ah, oh, you're going the wrong way, answered the peasants. You have to go back and climb the hills. Who is Don Bosco anyway? We don't know him. The parish priest of Sassi isn't called Bosco. No priest there bears that name. The wandering youth replied, we were told that Don Bosco is in Sassi, so we must be there. At last, directed back to the right path, they came to the parish. Three hundred young men, sweaty, splashed with mud, so exhausted with fatigue and hunger that it was impossible not to have pity on them. 
Don Bosco was called in, and he was greatly moved upon seeing that crowd of his little friends. What do you want, my dear children? He asked them. Do you have permission from your teachers to come here? One boy answered for all. We've been doing the spiritual exercises for a number of days now. This morning we finished them, and we want to make our confessions to you. Last night we waited for you in vain in Santa Barbara. When we didn't see you by this morning, with our teacher's permission, we left early to seek you in Valdoco, and from there we came here. We didn't say anything to the college superior because we thought we could return to the college for mass and communion. So many of us still need to make our general and annual confessions. Imagine the amazement of Don Bosco and his hosts. They couldn't help but admire that youthful energy and inspiration. Nevertheless, they tried to induce the boys to return to college quickly to relieve the anxiety of their teachers and relatives. But they might as well have thrown their words into the wind because they ended up yielding to the boys' wishes. In the meantime, Don Bosco and the other pastors found themselves greatly embarrassed. How could they hurry along such a great multitude of young people who wanted to make a general or annual confession? How could they all return in time to the college for communion? Besides, a dozen priests wouldn't have been enough to hear their confessions, and they all wanted to confess only to Don Bosco. The pastors found it easier to persuade them that this was impossible, and that they had to postpone receiving communion until the next day. Don Bosco went into the confessional, though he was almost exhausted of all his strength. The parish priest, the assistant pastor, and the communion master likewise entered the confessional. He remained there until an hour after noon without entirely satisfying the piety of those young men. There was another problem. In leaving Turin, those boys had done as the crowds who followed Jesus in the desert. Concerned only with seeking Don Bosco and confessing to him, they had left without any food because they thought they would return home before breakfast. So in addition to everything else, they had to be fed. Not being able to work Christ's miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, the good pastor nonetheless didn't abandon Don Bosco's boys and did his best to satisfy their hunger. He put out bread, polenta, beans, rice, potatoes, fruit, and cheese. In short, whatever food he possessed, he placed it all before the starving guests. But what he had at home was insufficient, so he had to borrow food from neighbors. In this way, that youthful army received the necessary refreshment, and no one fainted on the way back to Turin. But if Don Bosco and his generous host were embarrassed that morning, imagine what a surprise was in store for all the teachers of the Christian schools, the preachers of the spiritual exercises, and other guests. At the hour appointed for Mass and General Communion, out of 400 students, only a few dozen were present. All the others had either hiked to Sassi or had wandered off for the moment. From these facts, we can readily see how much Don Bosco was beloved by the young men who knew him. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you'd like to see a playlist of all the stories you really need to hear about St. John Bosco, please click on the link I've put on the screen. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you. Let's go, boy!